Community Connections CBMS Local sounds, thoughts, passions, and success Celebrate local Your neighbor's got a story to tell Happy Monday, happy Friday, Waterloo Region. It's the 10th of June, halfway between the meteorological start of summer and the astronomical start of summer. Stay tuned to CKMS for all the breaking news on seasonal changes. A little bit of new um, music from the Soviet influence, which is the angriest social justice band in southern Ontario. This is called Abolition Now. Abolition Now by the Soviet influence, decrying state oppression. And I think we may have a little bit of that happening here in Waterloo Region. We've got an, uh, um, an encampment at the corner of Victoria and Weber Street, and there is a threat by the municipality to evict the people who are living there. Got in the web conference with me today, Dr. Laura Pinn, and Dr. Aaron Day from the University of, um, from Laurier University. Welcome to ZKMS Community Connections. Thank you. Dr. Pin, Dr. Dr. Day, would you like to introduce yourself? Day, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I can start. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Aaron Day, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Criminology at, uh, at Laurier. 
And Dr. Pin? And Dr. Pin. I think Dr. Pin is still on Dr. mute. So we'll try to, that we'll try to get that fixed. So Dr. Day, in your position at the university, at Loria University, you're in the Department of Criminology. Now it seems to me that's exactly the opposite kind of department that we'd want to have dealing with social justice issues. Um, can you explain that? I sure can. Uh, I am a critical criminologist. And so what my work does is look at the ways that we are using the criminal uh, justice system, or what we might call the criminal injustice system, um, as a way of surveilling, managing, and operating um, people who are in a variety of uh, oppressed positions. And so that's, that's how I situate myself. Uh, in the in my department, but also just in criminology broadly. Okay. Hey, Dr. Pin, you're in the political science department. Can you uh, explain how political science might influence how we can deal with issues of homelessness, unhoused people, and possibly state violence against them? I have a feeling that Dr. Pin can't hear us. Well, perhaps Dr. Day, you can uh, start off with um, a bit of background information. What's been going on? What, uh, how did we get into the situation that we're in? What is the situation that we're in right now? Uh, that's a big question. Uh, it depends on the situation you're referring to specifically is. Um, what we do know is that across the country, we're seeing a rise in homelessness, in particular visible homelessness. So that'll be people um, who are sleeping rough in a variety of ways. Um, but the data that cities have been collecting over the last half a year um, in what we call a pit count or a point in time count um, has shown that in, in, yeah, in cities across the country, we see in some cases a doubling of homelessness we saw in 2018 when the last I think we may have just lost Dr. Day. They were having a little bit of technical difficulty here. Uh, these things always seem to happen right in the show, uh, never before the show starts, and you can uh, deal with them easily. So I think what we want to do is uh, just switch over to um, another piece of music by Soviet Influence. This is Thieves of Joy from their Thieves of Joy album um, from the Soviet Influence, while I sit around and twiddle with wires and knobs and buttons to try and get the technical problems fixed. Thieves of Joy. Cut a little bit short, the Thieves of Joy by the Soviet Influence. Uh, but I think we do have uh, Dr. Pin and Dr. Day back with us on CKMS Community Connections talking about the encampment evictions happening in Kitchener. So, Dr. Day, um, can you resume? You were just explaining where we're at, uh, how we got into this position, and hopefully what we can do about it. Yeah, I don't know where you lost me, so I Not feel bad if I'm going to be repeating myself. Um, you can hear me now. I think I can hear you. Can oh, hear you. Coming in clearly. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do a short version of, of what I droned on and on about. Um, <laughs> just that um, what we see happening 
in Waterloo Region is actually something that we're seeing happen across the country. So we know that rates of homelessness are rising, especially visible homelessness or people who are what we call absolutely homeless. So people who are um, sleeping on the street, in their car, um, in, in things like that. And so what we have are what we call point in time counts. And these are these counts that we do to try to assess what's happening with homelessness in any given city. And so just throughout the country, what we're seeing is the results of those studies um, that came out just recently in most cities show, you know, in some cases, a doubling of, of homelessness um, from our 2018 numbers. And so we know things are getting worse, um, that again, it's not unique to Waterloo Region. Um, and part of that is, is COVID. So we know that um, COVID wreaked havoc on our, our social services, um, that it left lots of people who were struggling to make ends meet in an even more dire situation. And then we have the housing challenges that I know that we all know about um, that's making things worse. So there's a variety of factors here um, that are leading to the situation that we find ourselves in, but uh, you know, recognizing that um, this is, a, this is a, a national, and I would actually argue an international problem. Yeah. And Dr. Pin, I think if um, you're able to unmute, I think we've got all the audio happening again. Um, you're from the politi political science department at Laurier. Uh, quick introduction. Yeah, so I'm from the political science department at Laurier. I'm an assistant professor there. I just started there last July. And so one of the areas that I research uh, is housing policy. Um, I'm doing some work on the inclusion of folks with lived experience of homelessness and poor need in policymaking. Um, I feel really strongly about participatory democracy and the inclusion of people who are experiencing systemic oppressions and making decisions about how we pursue um, remedies and policy action around that. And uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me. I've also been a member of the Unsheltered Campaign, which is a local advocacy group doing work around um, unsheltered homelessness in Waterloo Region um, for the past six or seven months. Yeah, yeah. And I see that we've just been joined by uh, Leslie Crompton. Welcome back to CKMS Community Connections, Leslie. Um, you've Thank been you, really fundamental in the Unsheltered Campaign. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, well, yeah, thank you. Uh, um, yeah, I've been with the Unsheltered Campaign uh, basically since we we started it and founded it back uh, pre-pandemic. Um, you know, uh, very much starting with sort of being an advocate um, and talking about the things. And then as, as we looked around during the p pandemic, we started to realize um, a variety of the gaps that were going on. Um, especially for those that were living rough at the time, um, because our systems, our shelters, didn't have the capabilities um, to properly put them in a safe environment, to provide them with the ongoing food, water, um, sanitary showers, etc., cetera, um, that they had been used to because we clo everything was closed down. And so suddenly there was this huge gap for these individuals. Um, and again, we're talking in March. So we're talking a very cold month mm -hmm. um, and, and still into the winter. Um, and so we started, started filling those gaps. Um, and as we filled them, we talked and talked more with lived experience individuals um, and began gathering more and more of the stories um, and you know, the unsheltered campaign, and you know, we've talked about changing the name because is it really unsheltered? What do, how does that fall with encampments? Um, also because a lot of what we also do are for, um, we also get involved with families in transition, which again, might be in a motel. So is that, so we really expanded at the last point in time count that the region did for the, the province on the what we call the hidden homeless so basically any number that you see quoted about homeless that exists it does not call the hidden homeless it doesn't include the individuals that are couch surfing it doesn't include the uh those with disabilities that are sleeping on a parent's floor um it doesn't include um families that are in motels um or you know four or five families in a one family dwelling. Um, because again, they're not registered with the system. 
right? So any of those numbers you see are those that are registered through our shelter system. Does it include situations? Yeah. Does it include situations? Does it include situations where uh, people are living in extended families? Uh, you know, people moving back in with their parents, for example. No, it doesn't include that because again. There, there's two components. One, by moving back to your family, you may not self-identify as homeless, mm -hmm. um, though in a lot of cases, but there's still a lot of cases where they do move back to the parents thinking that they can solve a problem. Um, and we've seen, you know, the, 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 uh, the police can talk about the escalation in domestic violence. And when I say domestic, I'm not just talking the usual husband and wife but we're talking family units where um, a, uh, an adult has moved back in who has their own mental health issues into a family that wasn't already doing well and just to have a roof over their head. So it adds um, and it aggravates all the other things that need to be supported so that individuals can have successful independent housing. Yeah. Right. So it excludes a lot because if you don't register and you don't fill out the forms to be counted through the regional system that they use, it's called HIFAS, um, you're not homeless in the government's view. Right. 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 The, the uh, point in time count that you mentioned, is that something that's being done by the municipality, by the regional uh, government, or is that something it's, that's done by the aid agencies? Um, so basically, it's it's a it's something that comes down, I believe, every three years. Don't quote me on that from the provincial government. Do you know, Erin, the answer to that? Yeah, it's uh, every two years. It's just that because of COVID, they let it go one more. Okay. So it was supposed to be every two years, and it's it's a federal requirement. So if you want, if these municipalities want their money. They have to do these point in time counts every two years. Yes. But what the municipalities rely on beyond their service providers is they rely on other agencies to go out and contact and do the point in time counts. So basically, and, and this year, this year, this go around was great because those of us who went and collected the information, collected the stories, the stories aren't necessarily a requirement, but it adds to it and we do. Um, we were actually paid for a change at a reasonable rate because, um, as you can imagine, sitting and talking with people, you're not going out there and going, I'm at an encampment, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, there's more than that. Um, to even find the individuals, um, there has to be a level of trust between your organization or who you are and that those communities right before they're even going to talk and say we want to be part of this point in time count um and so there's a, a lot of reliance on that and again it, it it's you know it it's done i think there 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 could be a lot more preparation and organization and lead up to it the challenge is is that those that can help with this again aren't necessarily um, paid to to do all this work Right. Um, and, you know, it comes down to, OK, how do we fit this into the rest of the life that we're living um, and all the other fires that we're burning? And I was just having a conversation with some of the region at micro bat versus macro level activities. And, and it's a challenge to get to some of this macro stuff because you're so involved with the micro. Yeah. So aside from doing the government's work for them. Uh, what other direct aid does uh, Unsheltered and, and the other uh, aid organizations provide? Um, so the Unsheltered um, and a variety of, you know, uh, Going Mobile, a better tent, uh, Going Mobile, KW, 519 Community Collective, various organizations, they, they provide food. Um, and the food provisions actually go well beyond just providing to homeless, but for um, we also provide a lot of food for those that are food insecure. So they're housed, but basically to stay housed, they basically don't have much food money or any other type of money. So we supplement that. Um, we supplement it through hot meals um, as well as uh, food ingredients. 
Um, you know, we've got some great uh, community fridges around, one in downtown Kitchener, one in Waterloo, um, that try and get mm -hmm. fresh produce out there because um, we don't realize how important, you know, you can only eat so many peanut butter sandwiches um, and have so many dinners that are made of pasta. Um, and I, I can tell you, I can tell you from having done, actually done a lot of the cooking myself in the beginning, when myself and another colleague, um, Charlie, we actually were cooking two nights a week for Cambridge. And we would go out Thursdays and Sunday nights, we would cook for 25 and then drive it out there. And I, I was trying to use just supplies that we were getting from places like the food bank. And it becomes very hard to, I was getting actually bored with the cooking I had to do because it was so repetitive. Yeah. Right. And so that's when, you know, through donations that we had, we, I would then go, okay, I am now going to find a sale on something <laughs> and I'm going to do something different. So right? if, if the cooking uh, is, yeah. is already approaching a level of boredom, uh, certainly the eating of the same meal day after day can't be any great shakes either. Well, it will exactly. And, and wanting to provide people with choice. Yeah. Right. Is another important thing. And, um, and their own choice, like be, because here's a, a situation where they don't have the ability to, to choose what it is they want to eat. I can go to the yeah, store and, and, and pick celery instead of lettuce. And, and, you know, that's great for me, but don't necessarily have that option if, um, if you're relying on donations. Exactly. And, and even just, you know, one of the big things is having, having, and this was, was hard at part of parts of COVID. And it, again, it takes a lot of volunteers to be out there because we would have different types of sandwiches and we would actually, but nobody could touch anything because only us, the volunteers could give something to someone. So we would have to say, you know, we've got peanut butter and we've got ham. We've got like, so which would you like? Yeah. Um, and how many would you like? That also became the thing because when we were doing it, when we're doing it, uh, we don't restrict. So if someone comes up and says, I come here and I'm grabbing something for myself and my wife, we go, okay, you can, you want two of everything, you get two of everything. We don't require Good. confirmation that they're not going to yeah. eat two of the same thing themselves. No means because testing. Yeah. No means and, testing. And no, dangers. no. If you go yeah. out, to, sorry, Bob. So there's no means testing. There's there's no uh, requirement no. to provide proof of, um, you know, lack of address that that sort of thing. Uh, exactly. Those who and, need know, come and and are served. Yep, yeah, and yeah. and you they they will. Yeah, you know, we have we have. I don't. Well, can try to think of what what was made that particular. I think it was a pulled hot pulled pork sandwiches a few weeks ago at, at, at the Cambridge outreach. And this one gentleman, he just could not, I, I don't know how many, he just, he sat there because we put chairs out um, so that they could sit around and actually eat the meal there and have sort of a little combo and stuff. I don't know how many of those sandwiches are like from, he was just like, Oh, this is so good. Yeah. And he, right. The same thing. If they, if, if, it, if a particular type of soup is appealing to them, it's like here and, you know, and, and what, especially 519 tries to do is when they come, um, they're getting at least two meals. So they're getting the hot meals that are there and there's usually a couple of choices and then they're getting sort of a lunch, a packed lunch, which has got a sandwich, um, a juice box, uh, a fruit or, and usually a, a treat, you know, Cobbs is great um, at providing all the different community groups with their leftovers. Um, and then if you are housed, there's also a frozen meal there for you to take home. So is it enough? Is, three meals. Yeah. Is, is it enough? Are people um, satisfied? Are they well nourished? I would like to think so. Um, but, it, but it's really hard to say because I'm just experiencing um, what they're having on that particular day. Um, and I think there are still a lot of, a lot of gaps um, and a, and a, a lot of, of inability to self-determine. Right. Um, and that is, is it's really hard because like you said, we get to go and choose. I feel like X tonight and I get to go and choose it. Yeah. Right. And, you know, and, and ladies, Laura and Aaron jump right in at any point in time because I can tuck your ears off. 
So um, is is this the great but, but, social safety net sorry. that Canada likes to think it has for its citizens? Is this I, is this know, how we do this? Sorry, did I say that again, Bob? We, we're all always told that Canada has this terrific social safety net. You know, we don't have to worry about things because there's a social safety net that will catch us uh, if we should stumble and, and need a lift. Uh, this sounds very much ad hoc. It sounds very much, um, I don't want to say at the whim of those people who can, who can afford to provide uh, additional assistance to people. Um, yeah, Laura. Perhaps Laura can can uh, let us know what what the social safety net is supposed to be from a, a political science perspective. <laughs> yeah, I love everything that you were saying, Leslie, because it's really about treating people experiencing economic poverty with dignity and the way that you would want to be treated, and the fact that why would we expect someone to eat something that we wouldn't want to eat? Why would you expect someone to eat something that might make them sick if they have dietary restrictions? Right? People should. Basic dignity should be being able to choose the food that feels good to you to eat, right? And we we don't, you know, for some reason, our expectations around basic dignity don't extend to people um, who are experiencing poverty, right? And so, yeah, this is, you know, we had a joke in the Unsheltered campaign about we needed to have a billing for filling initiative, like billing the state for filling the gap because of all the work that was happening, all of the volunteer and community work filling the gap of providing people in what is a relatively wealthy country um, with uh, you know, basic food, a little bit of food security, right? That is great for them that moment when they're accessing the food that the campaign was able to provide. But of course, then the next day, what happens? And a lot of this really goes back to, going back to the question about social policy, Bob, a lot of this really goes back to the fact that we, we talk about housing and we talk about food insecurity and we need to be talking about it in conversation with social assistance, right? So people who have disabilities, people who are unemployed um, and who are relying on social assistance for their income, we know that these rates are not enough for people to afford shelter and food. No. Right now, the single rate, if you're um, on Ontario Works, is about, I think it's $780. If you're on ODSP, it's about $1,150 a month, and that's for everything. And we know that those are not livable, humane rates. And so our, it really is a sign of how insufficient our social safety net is right now for people right. um, in those positions. So I was listening to the um, Waterloo um, Regional Council from Tuesday. And there's a lot of talk. Um, I didn't see much of the talk that would result in any action. Uh, but the thrust of the conversation seemed to be, we need more assistance from higher levels of government. Um, now, I know that the municipal governments tend to be more uh, uh, strapped for their financial accountability. You know, every penny is actually counted at the municipal level, whereas uh, it's more likely counted, uh, rounded off to millions at the, at the provincial and federal levels. Is that a reasonable thing for the municipality to, to ask for, to rely on higher levels of government to solve this problem with money? Laura? Yeah, I, maybe I, I'm really curious to hear what Leslie and Aaron have to say this about this as well. So here's what I would say. Housing is something that requires intergovernmental relations and multiple levels of government to manage. So yes, the region of Waterloo and the cities within that region, they're not fully making their own destiny in the sense that there's dynamics that are very much controlled by the federal and provincial governments on the one hand. On the other hand, we know that within the what's within regional policy purview, what municipalities can do, the powers that they have, there's lots of things that they could be doing. Absolutely. And in fact, you don't see a provincial or a federal encampment protocol, right? We see one at the regional level. The region has an encampment protocol because managing encampments on the ground is something that falls within the region's basket. So on some levels, I have some sympathy for that argument, and I think there's elements of truth, but I don't... I don't think that it's any excuse for elected officials at the local level to dodge, you know, the responsibility and not to be making full use of the powers that they have to take action. Yeah. Leslie? Let me unmute myself. I, I agree 100% with what Laura is saying. Um, it is, it's an ongoing, and the last two weeks, it's actually been an extremely 
angering um, situation that I continue to find myself in. Uh, because beyond food, um, I spend a lot of time trying to advocate and support for individuals or families uh, that are facing homelessness. Um, and I have been working with a number of individuals um, and they have, the, the region has its service providers and, you know, basically they are accountable. The region is ultimately accountable and responsible for the homeless and the housing that goes on. And then they contract with service providers to execute their service plan. Um, however, I'm not convinced that the oversight um, and the process in which they make sure those service providers are providing adequate service is appropriate. And I see this where I'm dealing with a situation, single parent, two kids, um, basically became evicted, became homeless. Um, and basically the way things are set up, that means if you qualify through Lutherwood, you go through to the Y, WCA, and they put you into one of the motels that the region, con the, that the Y contracts with. These are the same motels that they put the individuals from the encampments in. Not a place any of us would take our children or grandchildren to. And they say this is safe. So I have been working with a single mom who's absolutely refusing to go down that road. So we spent the last two months juggling money and moving around trying to solve this. Um, I asked two months ago to talk about policy change. Could we come up with another process that works a little bit differently so that parents don't have to stay in these motels that they don't want to stay into? But this is very, very, and, and, and it can be done. But again, it, and this is all within the responsibility of the region and its service providers. But there are some gaps in that relationship and in those mandates and the ability to talk at a macro level and make progress at a macro level. Um, and that is making more and more individuals fall through these gaps. Yeah. You know, sounds we have gaps where, um, you know, depending on what region is responsible, we let a father with his two-year-old son become homeless for over the weekend. Yeah. yeah. Right? Um, these, these are things that can be changed by the region, by the service providers. I do have concern that the service providers that are in play have had the same management and the same processes for too long. Um, and and there needs to be, you know, if we if we looked at things at a provincial level, a federal level, um, even at the city of Toronto level, there are auditor generals, and I really think that we are at a we're at a point where there needs uh, to be some more public accountability and 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 mm -hmm. transparency between the region and its service providers to actually say, are they doing what we think they're supposed to be doing? Right. Because I don't think they are. Um, this sounds like a long-term goal, though. I don't think this is going to be in place yeah. by the time that the eviction deadline for uh, Victoria and Weber is, no. uh, runs around. That's the June no, 30th, this, by the way. So yes. if people have been asked. What even, they're going to do. We've what got, we've got like 30 people there? 30 people in um, the en encampment at Victoria? No, and no, Weber? it's headed up past 50 now. Over 50 people. My goodness. Over 50 people are there. Um, yeah, that one... That one, uh, to be honest, I, given their stance and, and Laura and, and Aaron, please jump in because, you know, I can still don't see how they are going to resolve this in a safe and peaceful manner. Yeah. In, um, um, it, during the council meeting, the councillors all seemed sympathetic, if not motivated, <laughs> but the um, provincial government representative, specifically um, Mr. Ford, has been heard to say, you know, the best way to get yourself out of the situation is to get a job. Uh, perhaps, uh, Aaron, you could comment on the feasibility of that. Sure. Um, first of all, 
there are lots of folks who are experiencing homelessness who have a job. There was a recent study um, last year, this was on women and gender diverse people specifically, but showed that uh, in that sample, I mean, which was a Canadian wide sample, 30% of, of the folks who filled out that survey said that they have they have a job. 11% uh, of that was full-time work, um, but it doesn't make enough to make ends meet. I know, I've known tons of people who work at grocery stores, who work in construction, who work at restaurants, um, who are working, um, but it's not enough to pay their rent, right? It's not enough to, to make the ends meet. So, so first of all, people are working um, and continue to be homeless because of our lack of affordable housing. And then amongst those who are not working, we can think of a variety of reasons why it would be difficult to get and maintain a job while you're um, experiencing homelessness. We can think about, I mean, look at the burnout that so many of us who are employed have felt over the last two years. We're exhausted. Can you imagine if that's what your life is every day? You're trying to survive, literally survive, and you're expected to go and do your, your full day's work. Um, we should have a sense at this point of how untenable that is, of how unrealistic that is. Um, but then there's also just these really practical challenges that people might face. Transportation, how are you getting the money to get the bus pass to be able to go to work every day? How are you um, making sure that you are um, have the equipment? So steel-toed boots is a really big thing for people working construction. How do you get steel-toed boots to be able to, to do that? How do you... Um, how do you get the adequate amount of, of sleep to be able to be able to go and do that work day? Um, if you are staying in a shelter and you're staying in a shelter with sleeping in the same room as tons of other people concerned about your safety as you go on, or if you're sleeping outside, I don't know about you, but once I hit my 30s, I was like, ooh, sleeping outside is not something my back uh, can handle anymore, right? And we have people, especially we have seniors and older adults who are living in these encampments, um, who are people with disabilities, who are, are then expected to go and do a full day's work. And so, um, and then people who do get this full day's work, once you get that full, full day's work, once you get that paycheck and you're on social assistance, after you make $200, I believe is the amount, then your social assistance gets clawed back by 50%. And so there are people who are working full time and their childcare, costs more than they're making in their day. And so it's it's just not, the the, the math doesn't work out um, to be able to work for an unliving wage and then expect to maintain housing. That's the effective tax rate of 50% for the people who can afford at least. And yet we hear, you know, the oligarchy who pay virtually no tax at all in comparison. So, no. From a political point of view, that is something that could be changed. You know, if uh, there were to be something like a wealth tax, if there were to be something like um, a foreign holdings tax, um, that would provide revenue. Yet we see our provincial government slashing sources of revenue, like uh, license plate stickers and, uh, and carbon taxes. So uh, perhaps a comment from you, Laura? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point. You know, when we think about investment in affordable housing, investment in social housing, right? And this created environment of fiscal scarcity. So we have, you know, the government, the, the provincial government not pursuing particular revenue streams, which they could pursue and use to support, you know, federal co-investment in affordable housing. Um, but locally, something like a vacant homes tax, right? Or a tax on foreign home ownership, like that could be done locally. That's something that's not within the province, that well within the local and regional jurisdiction and something that could be explored locally. So there are steps, you know, even though there's this tension around some of these dynamics that operate at a higher level, there are steps that can be taken within the purview of local government. Um, but I wanted to like comment on what Aaron was saying about a lot of folks working, you know, who work full time may experience homelessness. Um, or hidden homelessness, you know, be stuck couch surfing. If you work full time on minimum wage, and we know it's hard to get a full time job because often they cut you at like 25 hours, so they don't have to pay benefits. But if you work full time, you make about $2,000 a month um, before any deductions take home, right? And right now we know in Kitchener Waterloo, a one bedroom apartment, you know, we see rents around $1,500, $1,600. Like it's just, it's so mismatched. Um, 
but you know, again, you've got a variety of folks experiencing homelessness, some who work full time, some who have disabilities and can't work. And if we really take seriously an approach of housing as a human right and a human right to housing, um, then it shouldn't matter whether you work full time, you work part time, you're caring for your kids, or you have a disability and you can't work, right? You should still have access to decent and appropriate housing. And so the region of Waterloo in their own policy documents, um, you know, they put, I, mean, I think it's great that they put forward um, a human rights approach to housing as something that they uh, would like their policy to be consistent with. The federal government through the national housing strategy, right, also has put forward a human rights based approach to housing. So I think we need to really work on actualizing that. I think it's really great to have it in those policy documents. How can we make that the lived experience of folks on the ground where they actually can access decent housing? Mm -hmm. Speaking of that human rights to housing, I don't think um, the region of Waterloo has actually passed that as a resolution yet. It was discussed at, uh, at the meeting, but it didn't actually get advanced to a motion. Um, but the international human rights declares that people are not to be evicted from a, uh, an encampment or from any place where they consider their houses. Yet, we see that happening all the time, specifically a lot of that in Toronto. And uh, recently, uh, it happened here in, uh, in Kitchener-Waterloo as well. What sort of legal ramifications are there for municipalities that violate international human rights? Perhaps Dr. Day, Dr. Aaron Day. If I understood your question correctly, um, uh, we, again, we know that federally we have adopted um, this human right to housing. So even if the region hasn't uh, adopted that yet, federally it, it exists. And so from my perspective as, as that critical criminologist, um, what we're doing if we don't uphold that human right to housing is that what we see and we see Toronto do it, but it's not just Toronto. I'm, I'm kind of tired of thinking that Toronto is, is the center of the universe and the center of Canada. We see it happening everywhere. We see it happening in Halifax, for example, at the same time it was happening in Toronto. We see that when we don't adopt that human right to housing, we are instead adopting largely uh, a criminalization of homelessness and, uh, and a militarization, as we saw in Toronto and Halifax, a militarization of these efforts to evict people uh, from encampments. And so we have uh, a human rights protocol that, that we can follow. Um, the um, former UN Special Rapporteur on Housing, who happens to be Canadian, uh, Leilani Farha and Dr. Caitlin Schwann, created a protocol that, that tells municipalities, here's how you do it, here's how you um, work with encampments in a way that complies with our international human rights obligations um, with an effort to recognize that people um, largely don't want to stay in encampments and want to be housed. The challenge there is that following that encampment protocol um, or the human rights protocol takes time. It is, it is, it is slow. And, um, People want quick fixes. People want immediate fixes. The challenging thing is evicting encampments, it's not the fix that people think it is. It's actually not going to um, end homelessness. It's not gonna end homelessness in that area. It's not gonna end visible homelessness, but it, but it quote unquote feels good for some of the housed population for just that little bit, for just that few days or, or a few weeks. Um, but it ultimately is a disservice to what they want, which is not having encampments anymore. So if we were just willing to have a little bit of patience and take that longer, more sustainable road, we might actually see real, um, real reductions in encampments and real reductions in homelessness. But we have to be willing to be patient. Yeah. Leslie. Yeah, and I just, I, I totally agree. It is a long process. And especially when we're, we're um, engaging with individuals in encampments, because it's not just um, housing first, which is a great concept, but these individuals need more than just housing first. If they do not have wraparound services, they will not maintain stable housing because for a wide variety of reasons. Um, you know, They've, they've been brought up in a system that has fed them. So they're not really sure know what to do with a kitchen, right? 
Uh, encampments provide a social life for those who want it. Others want privacy. Um, there are mental health issues that have to be addressed. Um, and we, we hear this and, and, and we talk about the inviolence um, and, you know, I'm not a proponent of violence by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but when we're dealing with shelters or some of the things that are happening in encampments, um, a lot of places have what they call a zero tolerance for violence, which conceptually makes sense. Totally agree with that. However, what is missing is the definition of what is violence. Uh, someone with a mental health issue who's speaking extremely loudly is not is is often considered violent so they are then evicted from the shelter from the hotel there's, there's a lack of um, there's a lack of an ability to manage those situations when you put them into motels for example um, where they're having to engage directly with the staff at the motel, the staff are not knowledgeable on how to manage those types of things. And so you often, so, so once you get to know that person and, and I can, you know, it's, it's their way of being. And yes, especially in, in the situation of men, because they tend to be larger and women that are working in motels tend to be, it tends to be women and smaller. It feels threatening but there's no intent there. And if people know how to handle the situation, then again, and it, it, it's no different if we get these individuals into apartments and things like that, there still has to be those wraparound ongoing supports. And to maintain stability, those supports have to be there for an extended period of time. It's not like, okay, Here's a month, and and we also sorry, and I'll, we also have to make sure it's not just it's it's anyone. So anyone that's living with hidden homelessness, who's been managing a job, as as Aaron was saying, they have been in survival mode, and even when they get that next permanent place, they still need ongoing supports. They yeah. need that person to talk to. They need that that direction to do this. We can't just, you know, some of the philosophies um, and the discussions I have with the region and the service providers is we're just going, okay, well, you know, they are high acuity, so they're able, to, or they're low acuity, so they're able to take care of themselves. So we're just going to put them into an apartment and they're going to be fine. Um, and I, I've listened to the stories where it's like, no, what, what, what do I do now? I still need that person to guide me through a whole bunch of other things to get me to be as independent as we expect people to do. So right? what, what then is going to happen to the folks at Weburn Victoria on June the 30th? Because those supports that you've just described don't exist at the moment. What can we do? What, what for example, is... Um, is are you able to do as, as academics? Um, Dr. Laura Pin in, in political science, how can you influence the outcome of the situation? I mean, I think, you know, I want to recognize I've got a lot of uh, privilege in the sense that sometimes folks from the region, for example, you know, connect with me in a way that they may not connect with people doing the work on the ground. So I think one of the things that I can do is, is try to... Um, encourage them to actually connect with and listen to folks doing the work on the ground, folks who are living in encampments, folks who are direct outreach workers. And a lot of those folks have been vocal about what they think needs to happen. Um, and you know, this June 30th deadline, it's in some ways an artificial deadline. There's no reason why this has to be June 30th. We know the land isn't going to be used until the fall, right? And so um, I think pushing back a bit on that deadline you know, there's no, again, there's no reason for it to be that deadline. And I think thinking about ways to um, better ground uh, folks who are actually living this experience right now in terms of being able to communicate with decision makers about what they need. Um, I think Aaron probably has thoughts on this as well. Go ahead, Dr. Aaron Day. Well, I, well, I think, yeah, I think, I think what Laura said is perfect. I think it's about um, um, 
pushing and, and you, using the privilege that Laura spoke about, pushing as hard as we possibly can um, to make sure that uh, the voices of, of the folks who are spending time in this encampment are the ones that are actually being heard. Um, the other thing I, I think I get it, we spent, you know, the beginning of this talk was about pit counts and, and data, and um, there's a lot of pushback about that. Um, because it's, you know, why are we using resources to count homelessness rather than responding to homelessness? Um, and maybe this is because I'm an academic, but I actually think that there is some, there's a lot of power to that data, that uh, that data can convince people in ways that it might not be able to convince people otherwise. And so, you know, hearing Leslie speak so eloquently about the need for ongoing supports after somebody is housed, I have data, research rigorous data to put to exactly what Leslie has just said. And so what I think what we can do as academics is, is use some of the, that clout that we do hold for having doctor in front of our name um, to leverage that for uh, amplifying the voices of the people on the ground. How does that get to the politicians who make the decisions? You've got the data, you've got the, the rigorous studies, you know what needs to be done. How do you get that to those who can make the change? Is that for me? Okay. That's you no, no, please do. You're like, no, I don't want to answer that. Um, and one of the things that we've been doing with the Unsheltered campaign is actually inviting um, both uh, counselors, local counselors, as well as staff into the meetings to listen to what uh, different community members and folks working with community organizations have to say around the issue. Um, and so I think that's one way of trying to ground those perspectives. Um, in terms of getting the research to folks, another thing that I feel really strongly about is trying to do community engaged research. So one of the things that my graduate seminar did last uh, fall was prepare a report on comparative encampment protocols from a human rights perspective, providing the region with some data about how different cities have put forward protocols to manage encampments and then providing some analysis, you know, in terms of what approaches are more consistent with a human rights approach. Um, so that's another way we can try and, you know, build those relationships and get some information, help build capacity at the regional level to do that kind of analysis. Right. And how about us non-academics? Um, Leslie, what can uh, ordinary citizens do to get involved? Well, I think that ordinary citizens, the first thing is to take a look outside yourself and try to actually understand. Take the time, if, if this is a real concern to you, take the time to actually talk to somebody at the encampment um, or others that, that have been supporting the encampments to get to know and understand how just how long this is going to take and how much personal resources it's not personal resources how much human resources it takes to make this successful and how and and to be honest if you and i don't have the stats in front of me laura or aaron do but in the region we do the the number of outreach staff that we have that are paid staff that go out and are supposed to be working with these individuals to find options to give them supports and things like that is very very limited and definitely does not allow for the number of hours needed to be spent with that individual, right? And I think that where the region and the government gets all caught up is they think that this, it's just like a factory widget thing. Boom, let's put it all on the line and we do this and this and this and this and this and, this and on to the same thing to every piece that comes down the line. And that's not how human beings work right yeah. and there's a huge trust factor involved as well that has to be built and i think that we have to just keep going out there and asking to talk at the macro level um <laughs> i've gotten myself into some difficulties this week at the micro level um but just you know go out to the community organizations and get involved see what's going on so that the, you can then speak to the region. I think the biggest thing is, is this year's an election year and we've got to take that brass ring while we can and do as much as we can. Otherwise we are going to have a tougher four years if we don't. Oh. Right. And that is my, my concern. I don't think there are a lot of regional councillors, a lot of city councillors 
um, that are, are basically on the same page as Doug Ford um, or, or, or potentially worse, to be honest. Um, there's, a, there's a few of them out there. Um, and so we've, we've got to make that change. We've, got, we've really got to say it is time for a change. This is a priority. Let's make it now and let's make shift the change. Let's change the politicians. Um, I do agree with Laura. We need to get engaged more and more with the staff, um, which is, is, again, hard to do because there's resource problems, yeah. right? If you're constantly fighting a fire, you don't have a, a, a great time to plan the next room on the house. Right. That's a bad analogy because I'm bad at analogies, <laughs> um, which is usually why I never try to do them. But, you know, if you're always fighting a fire, you're never able to think about the future. So then... It's the usual thing. Get involved in your local community groups, unsheltered. Um, there's a, a new coalition called CARE. Okay. Want to just expand on that, Leslie? Yeah, and, and Laura, you can jump in, and Aaron, you can jump in too, because you probably know a little bit more. So CARE um, is, so uh, Dave Alton, who's involved with CARE, is a member of the Unsheltered Campaign. And as we started talking um, they brought in the various other groups that they are grassroots organizations that they are involved with that are looking at other social justice issues um, to then figure out how do we all stand together on the social justice issues because they're all intertwined. Yeah. Um, and so that group is, is expanding. Um, there's got a lot of wonderful, um, younger than me energy <laughs> um which is great because that's the other thing we need some of us um just don't have the energy so we've got a lot of younger um fresh thinking new perspective individuals um that want to make a change and so they're standing behind this particular cause because it is a big one now and it all does tie together in terms of climate justice um our our uh truth and reconciliation, all these things tie together. And that's what the care group is, is trying to do. Um, Laura, Aaron, correct me if I've misspoken. So no, no, I think you got it. I just wanted to offer that social development center, Waterloo region has been a huge supporter of, of, you know, a lot of the advocacy work around uh, unsheltered homelessness. And you can go on civichubwr.org. Um, to follow the unsheltered campaign and to connect, you know, if you're interested in connecting in a more uh, immediate way, you know, I think a big part of it is just challenging the stigma that's present towards people experiencing unsheltered homelessness, recognizing that these are our neighbors and community members as well, you know, and reaching out to try and see which, which you can do to, um, to help. Well, I want to thank both you, Dr. Laura Pin, Dr. Uh, Aaron Day, and uh, Leslie Crompton from Unsheltered, all of you from Unsheltered. It's been a difficult conversation. I don't think we've actually solved anything by talking to each other, but hopefully we'll get some more involvement from the community. It's community radio after all. So thank you all for being here on CKMS Community Connections today. My name is Bob Jonkman. You've been listening to CKMS Community Connections. Community Connections is produced at the studios of Radio Waterloo. Executive producer is Jennifer Strong. Associate producers are Dylan Bravener, Jeff Steger, and Steve Todd, who wrote our opening theme music. Right now we're listening to Rose Brokenshire, a new song that she's releasing today, as a matter of fact. She writes that this song is a loving reminder for the times when your head is spinning with regret and you feel trapped in a world of worries. You're stronger than you know, and your life is worth living. Join us again on Monday at 11 a.m. to noon and every Friday from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. for CKMS Community Connections. This is Rose Brokenshire. Peace.